Hello, this is David Scheinbaum. Thank you again for joining us uh, to view this lecture, but as part of our series on the history of photography, you can access our website, which is photographydealers.com, and you'll see at this point probably about 50 different uh, written up talks on the history of photography, a number of other PowerPoint lectures, and a series of videos that we've been doing, which is also uh, displayed on our YouTube channel, which is Scheinbaum and Russick. So uh, again, we're trying to experiment with various ways of, of bringing you this information. Uh, today, I'll talk about my mentor, Beaumont Newhall. As you can see, I've delivered this lecture uh, a few other times. Um, at ASU in Phoenix and uh, to a photography group in Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, actually, when I delivered it to College of Santa Fe, where I taught for 30 some odd years, Beaumont uh, did this lecture with me. So it was the two of us. Somewhere I have a tape of that, um, but not today. And You'll see the last talk uh, at Wesleyan University in 1993. That was delivered in April, just two months after Beaumont passed. So uh, that was difficult. But uh, I've revamped it a little, and I'll try to share the information with you and, and maybe help you meet Beaumont. Well, this is young Beaumont, 1918. Um, Beaumont's mother was a photographer. He was uh, familiar with photography from a very young age, and in his home there was a darkroom. So uh, the idea of photography, cameras, uh, photographic chemicals, it was something familiar to Beaumont. He used to love to tell the story about being in his mother's darkroom and putting his fingers in the fixer and his mother turning on the lights, uh, destroying the plate she was working on, and quickly rushed him to the bathroom and washed his mouth out with soap. Um, so literally, he, he ingested photography at a very young age, and as we could say, it was in his blood. Um, of course, no harm was done from tasting the fixer, and uh, but he got an initiation like few of us have had. His mother was a pictorialist, very much uh, in the fashion of the Stieglitz circle, the photo secessionists, and this notion of romanticism and soft focus, um, you can see is kind of typified in this early uh, portrait. Well, in 1993, you'll see this book was published of Beaumont's memoirs. Uh, I put this here in the beginning rather than the end because uh, this is really one of the last things Beaumont worked on. He spent years um, preparing to, to publish his memoirs. Um, a first, the first year, which literally was a whole year, uh, he spent going through page by page of the diaries of his parents. He had his mother's diary and his father's diary, and he was looking for the day they met in both their diaries. And he felt, he goes, I can't stop my memoirs until I get myself born. And he went through their, their stories and, and, and kind of read it with relish, and he did indeed find the day that they both met and what they each wrote about each other upon meeting and then their marriage and then and then of course he being born so that that's 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 Beaumont you know to really go into that kind of detail uh the last year and a half or so of working on the memoirs Beaumont uh was stricken with kind of macular degeneration he had a lot of trouble uh with his vision so it kind of was a group effort between uh, Christy Newhall, um, Susan Wiley, who was his editor, and myself and Beaumont. Uh, we taped every section of the book uh, for about a year, another year, 
And those tapes were transcribed, edited, re-edited, read to Beaumont, corrected, and Susan Wiley pretty much did the job of, of putting it into shape. So those tapes uh, still exist, but they were the basis of, of the production of this book. Uh, it really was his last effort, and it was some you know publication that was very important to him. Much of the material I'll discuss today is in this book. Um, it's readily available on the various internet you know book sites. It's not considered a rare book. So if there are things that I talk about today that you find of interest, you might want to get a copy of the book and read more about about Beaumont and, and read more about these topics that I'm only going to briefly discuss today. This is Beaumont at his desk in 1984. So who is Beaumont? You know, if there's, you know, you know, if there's a father of the art of photography, we, we kind of give that to Alfred Stieglitz, who promoted the art of photography. Um, in another talk a few weeks ago, I did on Elliot Porter. I almost use these same words, and still, you know, Stieglitz might have been the person who did the most in America to promote photography as an art. Elliot Porter, of course. We consider the father of color photography. Beaumont is the father of the history of photography, really. Before Beaumont's history, there were a few others, um, one, one in German, one in French, uh, another American version, but they were all primarily technical histories of photography, histories of the processes, histories of the camera, um, lenses. You know, they were technical histories of photography. Beaumont really was the first person to bring this subject into an art historical context. He, he looked at the early practitioners of photography, um, started to categorize them within the various areas of photography we, that we still use now, i.e. landscape photography, documentary photography, artistic photography, portraiture, and, and etc. So he, he really considered it an art and, and promoted it and presented it as an art, both as an author and as a curator. Um, you know, the exhibitions he curated at his various institutions also kind of reinforced this notion of photography being an art form. His landmark book, The History of Photography, um, went through five different editions. It's still in print. It's been translated into five languages. He taught and lectured throughout the world. Um, the, the original copy of the book, which I'll talk about in a few more minutes, kind of was the catalog of his groundbreaking exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art entitled Photography, 1839 to 1937, which was an exhibit of roughly the first hundred years of photography. That exhibit contained over 800 objects, and, and I'll, I'll show you some in a few minutes as we move on. Uh, 1940, um, at the museum, he was curator, but then became the director of the Department of Photography, which is kind of the first uh, photography department at a museum in the United States. In 47, he left the Museum of Modern Art, and he went to George Eastman House. He was there from 1958 to 1971. He was both curator and director of that museum. And between those two institutions, uh, MoMA in New York City and, and Eastman House up in Rochester, you know, those two institutions continued to be two of the major depositories, archives, uh, institutions of photography, and they're both very much Beaumont's institutions. And he felt that way, you know, he considered those collections his collection. He received two Guggenheim fellowships, one in 1947, one in 1975, and in 1984, he was awarded the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship, which we consider the genius grant. So Beaumont definitely made his mark in, in the world of photography. But with all, 
all that he did academically. He was also an amazing man, gentleman, and friend and mentor to many. In the uh, end kind of of his career, uh, he, in 1971, he stepped down from Eastman House and he came to New Mexico. And he began teaching at the University of New Mexico. And to this day, many of the department heads of major institutions and universities throughout the world were students of Beaumont's at the University of New Mexico. That, for many years, was the go-to program to study photography. And it wasn't Beaumont alone. It was Beaumont and the historian slash photographer Van Deren Koch. And they really had an amazing program at UNM. Uh, when I met Beaumont, it was 1978. I basically moved to New Mexico to meet him, to work with him. Um, I saw Beaumont speak at the Metropolitan some years before at uh, the opening of the Paul Strand exhibition, where he lectured and then had a dialogue with Paul Strand on the stage at the Metropolitan Museum. And it was at that night I decided that I wanted to study with him and get to know him. And I literally moved to Santa Fe to try to see if I could make that happen. And indeed I did. When I first met Beaumont, um, I called. I was in Santa Fe for a few months. I was always kind of too nervous to call. And I finally wrote out a little script, what I was going to say. And, you know, and I don't know, I wrote out like a paragraph and I, I rehearsed it. You know, it was, it was one of those things, literally, you know, I dialed the phone, but I hung it up before I finished dialing. I was so nervous. But when I finally did dial and and the phone was ringing and Beaumont picked up the phone, I was like stunned. I don't know why, but I didn't expect Beaumont to answer. So as soon as he answered, I started stuttering. Uh, Mr. Newhall, uh, I don't know. I have no idea what I said. But after about 30 seconds, he just cut me off and said, would you like to come out and meet me? And I said, yes. And he said, when? I said, well, when? He goes, well, how about this afternoon? Come out at one o'clock. And he was so kind and so generous with his time. And, and indeed, that afternoon changed my life because it was during that day that um, I began working with Beaumont, which kind of went until he passed in 1993. And, and to this day, as the executor of the Beaumont Nancy Newhall estate, I still am basically with Beaumont every single day. I can't really put into words how it affected me, what I learned. It's, it's, I'm still learning. I am still hear him talking in my ear. I'm still digesting all that those years taught me, not just about photography, but about life and 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 about being a, a human being. Really, he he was he was a man of of the old world, and but very much a contemporary man, and and had so many life lessons to teach me. So let me show you what I learned that first week of visiting Beaumont. Let me take you into his home. This is the entrance. When you entered there, was on one side, there was this long hallway and that back door was the, that you see down that hall was the entrance to Beaumont studio. He used to like to keep uh, prints that he was working on he, out. So he walked by them day in and day out and, he always was moving images around, deciding what was going to be printed. So you see that whole shelf of photographs. Um, and this point in his life, he was primarily working in color. So all those color prints. And, and this is just the beginning of his library. The, the, the bookshelves kind of extend into his studio. 
When you look around the house, there were these treasures all over the walls. This is a Barbara Morgan photograph of Beaumont jumping, which was part of a series that Beaumont and Ansel um, that Barbara Morgan made um, basically fooling with her strobe. And I don't know if some of you might have seen some of the other photographs that there's Beaumont alone, but Beaumont with Ansel and Beaumont with Willard Morgan, who was Barbara Morgan's husband. And the three of them were just joking around and she was photographing. But it's Beaumont in flight there is very, very poignant. This was a treasure. It's a beautiful uh, Ansel photograph of Stieglitz with a letter that Stieglitz uh, wrote to Beaumont that he kept framed. Um, this again, this beautiful artifact in his house. The other images that grace the walls, this plate from Timothy O'Sullivan's uh, series of Canyon de Shea, that's the White House ruins. And this very rare um, and unusual Ansel Adams of the Pleiades. I'm not sure of the circumstances of Ansel, you know, doing astrophotography, photographing um, basically, you know, through a telescope, but this was a spectacular, very much an Ansel Adams print, but of a very unusual subject. And it really was a magnificent piece. And one of Beaumont's prize photographs is Mrs. Duckworth by Julia Margaret Cameron. Uh, he, he bought that very early at the Limelight Gallery uh, in New York and something that stayed with him pretty much for most of his life. Back in the hallway, you'll see, and we're going to revisit that uh, broadside that's hanging on the wall of Cartier Bresson. So I'll, I'll talk more about that later. And a little close up of, of those photographs. You know, so let me just say now, in terms of the sharpness, scanning these old 35 millimeter slides is kind of a art that we, when I say we, I mean Andra, my daughter, Andra Russick, um, who's been doing the scanning of these lectures for me. Um, it's, it's, it's another learning curve, like our beginning videos, which were, uh, again, a little shaky and, and such. Uh, anyway, this focus of some of these is due to our learning experience. Um, on learning how to scan all 35 millimeter slides, which of course I know nothing about, but she's in the process of mastering that. Well, this is the Beaumont I met in 1978 uh, when I came that first time. Um, of course, we were both still smoking, so smoking wasn't a, was not a problem. Um, and this was his desk, and I think it was nine out of ten times, and you walked into Beaumont's office. He was at his desk, piled with papers, working on a lecture or working on an article. Um, phone close by. You never know the phone would ring. It could be uh, Ansel Adams. It could be John Tchaikovsky. It could, you know, it was always, imagine a me, a 30-year-old guy who was just, you know, basically being with his hero and being in this environment and not being able to believe who would be calling. And when Beaumont would talk about the major figures of the 20th century photography, he referred to everyone on a first name basis. You know, we talk about Edward and Alfred and, and Ansel. And so it was like getting to know everybody on a first name basis. Um, it was pretty exciting, pretty remarkable, and pretty inspiring. Looking around Beaumont's uh, office, I'll try to show you. He was one of the, well, the first person I ever met that also had a, a standing up uh, desk. So sometimes for typing, he would, he would go and type standing up. I think now it's, it's a lot more common for people to have a, a standing desk a standing desk. So that was new to me. And then you could see those are all his slide files. And he was still teaching at UNM at the time. So twice a week, he had to prepare lectures. And this would be the area of his, of his room, of his office, 
where he would prepare those lectures. His files were amazing. These are his file cabinets, uh, basically A to Z. And, you know, I spent the first year, actually, it's like a kid in a candy store, um, going through these files, reading, reading some of the information. Beaumont had a file on everybody. And Beaumont's from the generation is when you wrote a letter, you kept a carbon copy. So those of you who remember carbon paper. So what these files contained was not just copies of letters he received or letters he wrote, but both sides of the correspondence. So you could open a file, draw like this one, you'll see S, you'll see the Stieglitz and Strand. But each, each of these files, if you open, you see the letter that Beaumont wrote to them, the letter that was written back, the letter that responded, the letter... So to be able to read both sides of the correspondence, pretty amazing. And these were living files. I mean, if Beaumont, you know, read an article today on Alfred Stieglitz, he would probably clip it and put it into the Stieglitz files. So these files were continually updated and they started, you know, pretty much in the, in the 30s, late 20s in, in some cases. And Beaumont's uh, and Nancy Newhall's archives, these files themselves now exist at the Getty. And um, they are all online. They've all been digitized. And um, as a scholar, you're welcome to, you know, make an appointment with the Getty and try to visit the Newhall archives. But that's where everything resides now. I think as a look into the W draw, you'll see you know, the Weston files, and and it's not just Edward Weston, but all the boys and everything related to his prints and everything related to his talks and his publications. And of course, a lot of personal correspondence. So these was amazing a resource. And Beaumont kept, had a practice if, with his students at UNM. Uh, one day a week, he allowed his students to come up to his room to his studio and use his files to do their research. So students here in New Mexico were able to actually have first person research opportunities. Um, it's, you know, there wasn't many opportunities or libraries even as good as Beaumont's personal library that were available to the students in the early days. These are boxes of original prints that he also used for teaching. He often would show examples of processes of various artists' works of, um, you know, basically teaching aids. Um, if you wanted to see a difference between an albumin print and or a carbro print or a dye transfer print or platinum, you know, Beaumont had um, available a teaching kind of collection that he he would use constantly. Uh, again, the, this is the slide area where he would prepare the slide lectures. And these files were his manuscript files. And actually, the, the drawers on the left were um, Nancy Newhall's, and the drawers on the right were Beaumont Newhall. And these were their manuscript files. So for every article that either Beaumont or Nancy wrote, they had the original, the first draft, the second draft, the third draft, the corrected draft, then all the way to the publication. So when you looked in, if you were looking for a particular article, you could not only see the article, but you could actually see the evolution of the writing of that article with the corrections and the changes and, and the updates. And if it was pr reprinted again, you'd see a whole new draft system and update. So again, these manuscript files are also at the Getty. Other works hanging those prints on the bottom are some of Beaumont's early vintage prints. In the prints, there's an Ansel Adams uh, snow and oak tree, and it's a Frederick Evans uh, portrait of Beardsley. The library was particularly important, you know, for Beaumont. Of course, he did 
all his own research and for the most part he had all the books he needed uh, occasionally he would need a book sent to him from a, a library somewhere else but for the most part he had what he needed um again this was accessible to his students but when i met beaumont he was in the process of being kind of unhappy with the way his library was organized you know it was all alphabetized from a to z with oversized books on the bottom shelves but he felt that it wasn't functioning for him as a historian as a writer so what we kind of agreed when i kind of put myself in Beaumont's hands was that the first project we would do together was redo the library. And you'll see these books, you see all those yellow dots. So Beaumont felt his library would be a lot more functional for him if rather than have the library cataloged alphabetically, we created sections, a section on history books, a section on technical books, a section of monographs, a section on contemporary um, criticism and on and on and we each topic we gave a color and so the process started with going through every book and giving it a color uh yellow um i guess i don't remember but looking at this shelf it looks like that's the history shelf and t technical books i see ansel's uh photo series on the second shelf there and the daguerreotype and so you know so we started dotting everything by color so there was yellow dots and red dots and purple dots and blue dots and uh black dots and after everything was dotted then we re shelved the whole library with those sections and keeping those color codes so whenever a new book arrived the first thing we would do is dot it with its color code, and then we would shelf it alphabetically. That took about a year or so, but it was through that project, and I think I was going twice a week, that Beaumont and I kind of began our, our friendship. Um, after the library project, I started uh, doing Beaumont's printing for him. He was uh, being discovered as a photographer again. Although he photographed his whole life, he never really showed his work. Um, and then, of course, um, I became Beaumont's traveling companion and when we would go to lectures and travel together. And I'll probably talk more about that as we go on. And this is one of Beaumont and Christie's six dogs. Um, and there were, I was telling um, Andre this morning that it was not uncommon if somebody arrived at the house they would sit in their car because these six dogs would immediately start barking and, and kind of attacking the car. Um, it was kind of scary for a lot of people. People would sit out there and be afraid to get out of the car. I'm sure a lot of you listening might have had that experience at Beaumont where one of us would have to go out and kind of rescue you and call the dogs off and walk you into the house. The dogs were friendly and fine, but it could be somewhat intimidating to drive up to a house and have all these dogs kind of jumping at your door. Um, but the dogs were part of the household and, and it, they, were, they were fine. And I think once they got to know you, there was no, no problem. Well, Beaumont uh, discovered kind of photography for himself while he was still at Harvard. Um, as I said, Beaumont's mother was a photographer. He was always interested in photography. He was also always interested in film. And, you know, Beaumont as a young man was also already a budding historian. Beaumont would go to see m films, see movies, and then he would come home and he would write uh, reviews just for himself. He kept a whole book of film reviews that he wrote as a, as a child. Um, one film in particular um, that he saw in the fall of 1926 was a film called Variety. And this was a German silent film. A camera work was done by Karl Freund. And Beaumont always described it as, you know, 
it was shot. It was the story was about uh, two trapeze artists in a circus who fall in love, and so a lot of it is shot looking up at these trapeze artists flying through the air, flipping and swinging. And Beaumont, you said, you know, when he would talk about it, he said he never saw anything like it. That the angle of view, the the movement, the panning, the cutting, the the excitement, the visual excitement of of this camera work, it totally got him interested in this notion of, you know, looking up what he would call, you know, bird's eye view or worm's eye view, looking up or looking down. You know, it makes us think of, you know, Russian constructivism or uh, German expressionism, you know, but these angles of view were so um, vivid to him in these films that that kind of inspired some of his early photographs. It was a little disappointing for him at Harvard. Um, they didn't have a way to study photography. And, you know, he finally went to one of his advisors at Harvard. And the, the advisor said, well, paintings are pictures too. And it was, you know, based on that statement that Beaumont ended up studying art history and being an art history major. But Beaumont found a way by the time he graduated from Harvard to make photography not an official major, but to make photography his area of study. But this film variety that I just mentioned inspired, this is one of the earliest serious photographic attempts by Beaumont. Um, you'll see it's from the Murray, Ho Murray Hill Hotel. It was done in 1927. Another um, inspiration for Beaumont's early work it came from a, a book that was published um, by a German architect, again, still Germany, a German architect named Eric Mendelssohn. And Eric Mendelssohn did a book on, it was called America. I'm going to show you, I'll show you the cover in a minute. But it was basically photographing the skyscrapers in New York. And when Beaumont would talk about this book, he, he, he'd say to me, you know, you, as a young man, he would hold the book over his head. He said the the angles were so severe, this idea of looking up, that if you held the book over your head, you could really appreciate the Erich Mendelssohn photographs that were in the book. And again, that inspiration is very specific to this 1928 photograph um, of the Chase National Bank, which was done in Lower Manhattan. Totally, again, the inspiration came from this Mendelssohn book um, on American architecture. So this excitement, the camera angles, the, the ability to, to look and compose, um, this is really where Beaumont kind of enters, you know, the photography of, of, him, of his own work. Um, but I think it was this period that excited him his whole life. He loved these these strong angles, angles of view, and we're going to see that keep popping up while we're looking at his work th throughout this talk. Uh, Beaumont's first kind of real job as a photographer was to produce this little portfolio um, of these early Victorian houses in. Um, basically many of them done in the 1840s. But he was asked to produce this portfolio of images um, of these early Victorians. And the only copy of this portfolio that I found to still exist is in uh, Tarrytown, New York. There's something called the Sleepy Hollow Restoration. It's the historical society in Tarrytown. They have the, the whole portfolio of 18 photographs that Beaumont made of these houses. So you'll see this very, very formal approach. He certainly knew, you know, photographic technique. He knew how to use a view camera. Um, he, he was very passionate, you know, himself from very early on as, as a photographer, not just as a historian of photography. Well, after Harvard, Beaumont um, had a few jobs, one at, in, uh, at the Pennsylvania um, Museum in Philadelphia Museum, 
um, at the Metropolitan for a while, but he finally landed a job as a librarian at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, one of his professors at Harvard, uh, Paul J. Sachs, recommended him to Alfred Barr, who was then the director of the Museum of Modern Art, and Beaumont was hired as the librarian. But in the museum, it became known pretty quickly that Beaumont had an interest in photography. And beside his office, downstairs uh, in the library of the museum, which was a brownstone, basically, Beaumont uh, set up a darkroom, and he was the go-to person to photograph uh, installation shots for the exhibitions, to make prints for reproduction. He, he was the librarian, and he was the photography person at the museum. So this led to being stopped in the hall one day by Alfred Barr, uh, basically off, almost offhanded, just saying to Beaumont, how, how would you like to curate an exhibition on photography? And Beaumont said, the way he would tell it is he, he stumbled and said, uh, well, yeah, sure. Uh, what do you want? And Alfred Barr looked at him and said, well, it's not what I want. It's what you want. And then Beaumont said, well, I think for our first exhibit on photography, we might want to do a survey of, you know, roughly the first hundred years of the medium and have kind of an overview of, of photography. And Alfred Barr said, fine. They were just anonymously uh, given some seed money to produce this exhibition. And then Beaumont said, you know, as a, almost as a second thought, he blurted out, well, I, you know, I'd have to go to Europe. And Alfred Barr looked at him and said, well, yeah, of course you will. And it was that, that little meeting in the hall that um, was the beginning of working on Beaumont's exhibition, but it's also the beginning of his marriage to Nancy Newhall because he quickly went home and called her up and proposed because they were going to use this European collecting trip as their honeymoon. So it totally changed Beaumont's life right then and there. And of course, you know, the rest of that story is history. Well, at the time, Beaumont, you know, needed or felt, you know, that Alfred Stieglitz had to be involved. And, you know, first Beaumont wanted to include Stieglitz's work in the exhibition, which Stieglitz refused. Then Beaumont wanted to dedicate the exhibition to him, which Stieglitz refused. You know, finally, at the end result, Beaumont was able to borrow some gravures um, of Stieglitz's to show, but Stieglitz um, would not lend him original prints. And Stieglitz was not so easy on him. He considered Beaumont that guy from the museum, as Beaumont would say. Um, but it was, you know, Beaumont's own photography really that won Stieglitz over and, and became kind of their lifelong friendship. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. This is a photograph Beaumont made in 1978 of 291 Fifth Avenue. And on the upper floors of this building in the foreground, in, not the one under construction, the one in front of it, that was the location where an American place was located, which Beaumont would frequent almost weekly. And it was, as I said, it was Beaumont bringing his own photographs to Stieglitz that began their friendship. And Stieglitz would give him pointers about cameras and lenses and developing and printing. But this story is, is most amazing. Um, Beaumont brought this photograph on the left um, which he called after the blizzard of that man walking and showed it to Stieglitz. And Stieglitz took, took that image in his hand and he pondered it. The original print of that is three and a quarter, four and a quarter. And I'm going to tell you this story now, but imagine this. If you were a student of photography, imagine your teacher doing this. Or if you were my student, imagine me doing this. Stieglitz held that print in his hand and he said, oh, it's interesting. And after a minute or two of pondering it, he opened his desk drawer, he took out a pair of scissors, and he proceeded to cut 
this the photograph with his scissors and handed Beaumont back this image on the right, which is one pretty much one and a quarter by one and a quarter. He cut he cut that little square out and he handed it back to Beaumont and he said, Well, here's your picture. And I don't know that there's a teacher that would do that to a student's work today. But of course Stieglitz was absolutely right. And this little tiny print is really became one of the great treasures of uh, Beaumont's early vintage work. And it was an incredible lesson for Beaumont. And then Stieglitz went on to teach Beaumont how to intensify negatives, how to bleach prints, and how to dry mount. And, and again, this led to their great friendship. And, and, you know, by later editions of the history of photography, if you have some of those early editions, you'll see that Stieglitz finally permitted Beaumont to dedicate um, the book to him, but not in those early editions. You, you won't find that. Well, when it came time for that show, it was photography, as I said, 1839 to 1937. Um, Beaumont, you know, had spent a year uh, going through Europe, going through the United States, uh, meeting a number of photographers, collecting a lot of 19th century work, and be beginning to assemble this exhibit. While in Paris, he actually met the son of Nadar, Paul N D Nadar, who I think was near 80, but Beaumont arranged for Paul Nadar to make this portrait of him, and Beaumont felt you know, sitting for this portrait was as close to an experience of being photographed in the 19th century possible. And being in that Paris studio and having that Nadar's original equipment all around him, um, it was a great thrill and learning experience for Beaumont. And this was, as you could see, it was done in 36. And the catalog for that exhibition was kind of, some people consider it the first edition of the history, but it's really the second edition of this catalog is really the first edition of the history, which at that point it's entitled The History of Photography. But at this point, you'll see it's entitled Photography 1839 to 1937. The cover was designed by Alfred Barr himself. It's a beautiful cover design, and Alfred Barr was very excited and very interested in designing in this kind of modern style. And again, this is the book that was expanded into Beaumont's classic history. Um, I do have a number of installation photographs of that first exhibition that I could share with you. Um, this kind of was the entrance when you walked in um, that first image of the man photographing um, and you'll see the space around it. So if you were standing, you know, to the right of this picture, you were able to see this, you know, kind of a contemporary person at the time photographing with a small camera. But when you look through it, you saw this 19th century um, engraving of a woman being photographed in a studio. So you kind of saw the, the 1839 to 1937, got that idea as soon as you entered the exhibit. The exhibit, as I said earlier, included over 800 objects. So they weren't all photographs. Uh, Beaumont had apparatus. He had, you know, cameras you could look into. He had pinhole cameras. He had examples of early expeditionary um, equipment where you saw wet plate uh, chemistry. Um, some things were right out in the open. Some things were in cases. You saw examples of, you know, daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, tintypes, carte visites, you know, many of the early processes that led up to the invention of glass plates and then film and and on you saw negatives and prints as i don't know if you could tell but these negatives that are in the case at the foreground there's a little button there on the right you were able to press that button and it illuminated those negatives 
And then right above them, of course, you saw the positives, you saw the prints. So it gave someone right away that, you know, the that understanding of the relationship between negative and positive. Of course, he included the work of many of the key 19th century photographers. Um, of course, Julia Margaret Cameron. And of course, it makes sense to have the portrait of Sir John Herschel, who was so instrumental in, in helping the development of the invention of photography um, in terms of naming positive and negative relationships and determining fixer and did all help William Henry Fox Talbot so much in his invention and, and Julia Margaret Cameron in, in her work. He included uh, images like this. Uh, you know, again, if you're familiar with the two ways of life, this image was made from 30, I believe, 35 different negatives. So, you know, everything from, you know, a straight portrait from Cameron to this, what we would call a combination print, you know, the seamlessly produced Rayland image, um, just to give a sense of the potential of the photographic process. Uh, these are illustrations from the book, you know, just to give you an idea of the scope of the show, you know, the work of Eugene Atche on the left, the Maholi Naj image of the Bauhaus on the right, and many of the Bauhaus photographers were included in, in this exhibit. Um, then he had areas of, like his history does, uh, photojournalism, scientific photography, artistic photography, um, you know, so these various areas where he acknowledged all of the applications of the photographic medium. Again, realizing this is, you know, 1937, so much of this was new, to the general public. So having that speed graphic and showing those um, spreads, newspaper spreads on the left, as well on the right as showing some early, what we would net today, you know, call photo, photo journalism. And of course the, what we might call fine art work of Paul Strand, Edward Weston, of course Ansel Adams. So, you know, it was incredibly comprehensive. There's many, Many graduate students and scholars have, of course, gone back to this show. You know, who was included, who was not included, why did Beaumont chose? You know, Beaumont would always be stopped whenever he would lecture by people. How come so-and-so wasn't in this show? How come so-and-so was in the show? Why did you do this instead of that and this and that? But basically, you know, Beaumont worked from what he knew at the time, you know, and, and, and there, in many cases, when people ask him why he didn't include certain people, he, he wasn't aware of them or their work at the time, which is, is and isn't an excuse, but it's just the reality. You know, Beaumont didn't know absolutely everyone working in the world at the time that he did this show. But this show is basically kind of the beginning of, of not only a museum promoting, you know, photography and showing photography as an art, but also understanding the history, not just of the process of photography, but understanding who were the early masters of the medium and what their contributions were in every area of, of the medium and in, in every application of the medium. So, you know, if, of course, if you've studied the history of photography, probably nine out of 10 of you, you know, had Beaumont's history as your, as your textbook. Well, in 1940, um, Beaumont, you know, through his work at the museum, was already very close friends with Ansel Adams. Ansel was on kind of the advisory committee of the photography department and um, Ansel and his wife Virginia and Beaumont and Nancy Newhall, they were all great friends. So in 1940, uh, Beaumont and Nancy took a trip to San Francisco and their original intent was, you know, to visit Ansel, but they were going to visit some, some family members. But I, the way Beaumont would tell it, you know, as soon as they arrived, Ansel met them and they, you know, where they originally were going to stay, Ansel said, oh, you can't stay there. And he took them to another place and different part of town. And, 
they had dinner and you know one thing led to another and the next day Ansel said well he has to go down and um, bring something to Edward Weston in Carmel why don't you join us and um, Beaumont didn't really know Edward very well at the time and Beaumont and Nancy kind of forgot about their original plans and they went down to Carmel with Ansel and ended up spending their week primarily with the Westons and that became a lifelong friendship and collaboration as many of you know Nancy ended up authoring a number of books about Edward Weston and and of course Beaumont and Nancy curated a number of exhibitions this image is Beaumont of Edward photographing at China Cove it's right near Point Lobos and Beaumont was planning on photographing that week and he first made this image and um, and after he made it to Beaumont's surprise Edward Weston invited him to develop the film in, in his darkroom so Beaumont you know graciously accepted and developed this negative and he came out of the darkroom and he showed it to Edward and Edward said well aren't you going to print it and Beaumont said well sure so he went in back into the darkroom and he made a print and and then showed it to Edward Weston and he said well aren't you going to uh, burn this area and dodge this area and you know basically even it and Beaumont remembered being flabbergasted he was he he himself was so caught up in this dogma of group F64 and this straight photography and he, Beaumont said he kind of blurted out you know did you say dodge Mr. Weston you know and and because Beaumont thought dodging and burning was kind of not permitted by the straight photographers and Weston looked at him and smiled and said of course you have to dodge and burn you have to make the best print you can and so that little lesson right then and there kind of gave Beaumont the idea of the difference between you know uh, understanding what work is about versus kind of philosophy is about and although the notion of straight photography is a philosophical notion to be able to produce images without manipulation it certainly doesn't um, do you know do it at the expense of producing an inferior photograph so you know he he learned a lot during that trip and then Beaumont decided rather than spending the week making kind of little Edward Weston's uh, at Point Lobos he would photograph the house and, and Beaumont call this his little Edward Weston suite um, this is uh, Edward Weston photographing I'm sorry looking out of his darkroom window now this notion of a darkroom window is kind of absurd but it wasn't really a window as much as it was a vent and you know Beaumont said he was he wasn't planning on making this a picture of Edward Weston he was actually setting up his camera to photograph the side of the darkroom and in the middle of setting up the camera Weston kind of opened the shutter and was just going to the window to take a breath of fresh air when Beaumont made this picture but that was basically the vent the air vent so that Weston every once in a while would go out and kind of get some fresh air and then close it back up and continue working in the dark room this was uh, Edward Weston's kitchen it's a beautiful suite and it also I think exemplifies the simplicity of the Weston household and I think as simple as that housework was so was his photographic uh, methodology which also really quite simple um, this is Karis Weston's typewriter you won't be able to see it in the slide but she was in the midst of typing the manuscript for California in the West um, over the years people always would ask Beaumont you know what's that string doing hanging you know from that typewriter some of you will know right away what that is others of you won't I think it will depend on your age but that was would be a, an eraser a little round eraser with a little brush at the end and when you typed in those days if you made a mistake 
um, you would have to erase it from the paper and, and retype it. This was before whiteout or correcto tape or all those other things um, that we used all pre-computer. Probably what Beaumont said was the most important thing in the house was the coffee grinder. You know, sitting, having coffee was very, very important. Um, very much an important part of the day. So photographing that coffee grinder was really photographing a central, <laughs> central piece of equipment in the home. And this image of Prince and Fruit. And Beaumont would talk a lot about how the evenings were spent. Um, Weston would put out a bowl of fruit and bring a stack of prints out and hang up like a little clip on reflector flood. And that reflector flood light would be basically focused on the easel. And Edward Weston, in silence, would put up one print at a time. He would decide when the time was up and then he would change it. Sometimes it would be minutes, sometimes it would be more than a few minutes. Um, but they would look at prints uh, the way Edward Weston wanted that. And those were cherished moments by Beaumont and Nancy. And, and then Beaumont would go on to relate that Edward, every time he would clip on the, that reflector floodlight to look at those prints, he would say, this is my only use of artificial light. <laughs> and it's the only time he would use artificial light was to look at prints. He never used artificial light for his photographs. And this, these are by Nancy on the left. Um, Edward Weston during that week photographed both Beaumont and Nancy and made portraits. And um, this, of course, the image on the right is the portrait that Weston was making during this very moment. And somewhere we have this same pair of Beaumont's picture of Edward Wesson photographing Nancy and that Nancy Newhall photograph. Well, earlier on, I mentioned Beaumont's interest as a young man. I told you he wrote these film reviews and he loved reviewing films just for himself. The other thing he loved as a young man was ships, sailing ships, uh, old, uh, you know, what multi sail I forget what those call those schooner big rigged ships and Beaumont made models he made what we would consider professional ship models I know at least two of his ship models uh, still exist in the museum in the Peabody Essex Museum I know in the memoirs we reproduced uh, Beaumont did a, a model uh, recreated a model of the Santa Maria so I know that's at the Peabody Essex, but I also think another one of Beaumont's ships. So he would painstakingly create these models um, of these square riggers and loved it. And he grew up in Lynn, Massachusetts. So being around water and being around ships, um, it also was a way for Beaumont to make extra money as a young man. So he loved ships. So in this one trip to San Francisco, um, this was also during 1940. He photographed this Fife Rail of the Pacific Queen. And this is what he called the Port Main Brace Block. So, you know, if Beaumont, you know, when I travel, if we were in San Diego or if we were in some city that had a harbor, one way or another, we would spend an afternoon down at that harbor either eating or drinking or photographing. But um, Beaumont, his whole life, he loved, loved ships. And that was something that went back to his childhood. So again, it's, it's you know, these things, how they relate, and it all starts making sense. But in, in the mid-40s, uh, Nancy Newhall and Paul Strand were working on the publication of um, Time in New England, which is a book I think many of you are probably familiar with. It was the photographs of Paul Strand and Nancy's text um, was, you know, poetry excerpts from 
Mayflower passengers. And um, it's, a, it's really an early book where we see relationship between photography and text that didn't exist before, which was kind of one of Nancy's great genius contributions to photographic literature. But they, of course, spent some time up at uh, Mystic Seaport, which is kind of now it's an outdoor museum. But this is uh, Paul Strand uh, photographing in 46. But while there, Beaumont made this photograph, which he called Mac Mackerel Sky in 46. So although Beaumont was along taking some pictures, this was really a, a work trip between uh, Nancy Newhall and Paul Strand. Well, one of Ans well, one of Beaumont's closest friends I've mentioned, you know, Ansel, you know, was a lifelong friend to the very end, as was Henri, um, Henri Cartier-Bresson. Um, they met early on and, and they were great friends, uh, phone calls, correspondence. Um, they had a lot in, in common and, and they had great admiration for each other. Uh, this image was made, um, again, it was uh, one of Be Beaumont's uh, kind of a, a commercial job in a way. Um, Cartier-Bresson came to New York for his uh, exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art and Beaumont was asked, I think it was by popular photography, to make this portrait. Those of you who know about Cartier-Bresson, you probably know he didn't like to have his image taken. He didn't like to have his image made. He felt if people knew what he looked like, uh, he wouldn't be able to do the work he did because he would, he would work so surreptitiously and quickly in the streets. He, you know, I think a lot of people didn't know who he was or what he looked like. And of course, if he brought attention to himself, it would have interfered with the kind of imagery he, he made. In any case, he, he agreed to having Beaumont photograph him. So when Beaumont uh, took out his Leica to photograph Cartier-Bresson, Cartier-Bresson stopped him right away and he reached into his bag and he had just come from Europe and he had this new Leica lens. Um, it was, you know, at the time it was, it was a pretty large aperture and without kind of going into all the technical aspects of lenses and photography, you know, lenses are, are kind of uh, categor categorized both by their focal length, which tells us if it's a normal lens or a wide angle lens or a telephoto lens, but also the size of their largest aperture, because the larger the aperture, the better it is kind of under low light. So Bresson had this new lens. Um, he took it out of his bag. Um, I believe it was an 85 millimeter 1.5 lens, which is a very large aperture um, for the day. And he handed it to Beaumont and he said, here, try this lens on your Leica, on your camera. So Beaumont graciously accepted Bresson's lens, um, screwed it onto his own camera and made this portrait, took the lens back off and handed it back to Henri. So, you know, in essence, Beaumont, you know, made this photograph with his camera, but Bresson's lens. And, you know, I think you could see in the portrait, you know, some of what Bresson had been through during those war years, um, being in the French underground, getting captured, escaping numerous times, um, and then finally kind of getting to New York for his show, which, which in itself was kind of a, a pretty big ordeal. But this is a portrait that not only Beaumont liked, but Bresson continued over the years that I worked with Beaumont. Uh, when Bresson was asked for a, a photograph for reproduction of himself, he would often call Beaumont and ask, could he use that picture? So I know it's an image that Bresson also liked very, very much. This was, uh, I mentioned earlier, this was hanging in the hallway of Beaumont's house. Um, Beaumont loved this. The, of course, the image on the left is a you know, portrait of Beaumont 
um, by Bresson. And the image on the right is actually, it's an original print of Beaumont's that was mounted to this little poster to promote this lecture Beaumont was giving. And Beaumont loved the notion that it was sold out. But Beaumont took these two, you know, separate objects and, you know, we put them together in a double mat and we framed it. And this always hung in Beaumont's house. He he just kind of loved the, you know, his portrait of Bresson, Bresson's portrait of him. It's their friendship, the lecture, the sold out aspect of it. So it's kind of a was a kind of a favorite memento type piece. Um, we have it here at the gallery today for those of you who are in Santa Fe or if you ever want to come over and see it, we'd be glad to share it with you. And this was taken uh, on the roof of Beaumont and Nancy's Brownstone in 1946 in New York, the roof where they lived. And again, Nancy, you know, it kind of will require a separate le lecture, but, you know, Nancy wasn't, you know, the woman behind the man. You know, Nancy was a real partner of Beaumont's in, in their work. They, they were both curators of photography. They were both writers. Um, they worked together during the war years when Beaumont was in the surface. Uh, Nancy um, took over his position at the Museum of Modern Art as curator. Um, her, her publications, her exhibitions um, are equal to everything, you know, Beaumont did. And again, I alluded to her contribution to the photographic book by mentioning the time in New England. Um, her, the way she used text with images were some of the very first books where we don't have a redundancy. The text isn't about the photographer. It's not about the pictures. The text, it, it shares a similarity of, with the subject matter of the pictures. So I like to say it's kind of one and one equals three. It's, you know, the text stands alone, the images stand alone, but together you have a elevated book and it's the the book she did with Ansel Adams the book she did with Edward Weston the book she did with Paul Strand her many articles the work she did with Aperture with Minor White um, I think um, sooner or later I'll just have to um, scan the slides and and do a full out Nancy Newhall lecture which which I will do uh, Beaumont was invited um, in 1959 to teach at the School of American Studies uh, in Salzburg, Austria. The School of American Studies is housed in this Baroque uh, castle um, called the Schloss Leopoldskron. And, and as Beaumont did in Edward Weston's house, meaning he made that little suite of, of, of the house, Beaumont made a little suite of about 10 images of the Schloss Leopoldskron uh, for the time that Beaumont was there. He actually was there and then he went back um, again uh, the following year. But these are two of the images from the Schloss photographs that he made in the 50s. Um, it's of course the mantelpiece. And this is kind of of the ceiling and railing. Um, the, you know, the detail, the gold and white and, and brass and, you know, as you could imagine kind of it being a great place to photograph. Um, and, you know, Beaumont loved teaching there. He loved working with European students. He not only did seminars on photography, but it was a, also he had an opportunity to bring back his love of film because um, one of his seminars was on cinematography. And he loved being able to, you know, bring that back into his academic uh, environment and teach about uh, film history, which is something he knew a tremendous amount about. You know, his photographs are in a way a visual history of photography. You know, his friends, as I said, you know, the people he knew, the, his friendships were, you know, through his work. 
it included everybody basically and and you know the stories and the things Boma was able to tell about them write about them um the information in his archives is kind of amazing um very you know nice portrait of Charles Sheila um Beaumont and Nancy were close with Charles and Musha his wife and spent time upstate in New York with the Sheilas often Beaumont said about Sheila that he was one of the few people that didn't confuse painting and photography. Beaumont felt his paintings were paintings and his photographs were photographs, and there was no confusion about it. And, uh, you know, Beaumont loved, you know, both those works by Sheila. But I think there's a lot, you know, thinking about people who work in different mediums who are actually able to maintain the integrity of those mediums, where Beaumont would say, without confusing them, Sheila would be a great example. And if you know his, if you know his paintings and photographs, I'm sure you'll agree that he, he really understood both mediums for you know, what they're truly best at portraying. Other close friends were the Morgans. Uh, Willard Morgan was the husband of Barbara Morgan, a photographer, but Willard was also, if you know, the publishing house of Morgan and Morgan. Well, it started in their basement. Uh, Willard Morgan was a printer. Um, he had all this, you know, printing apparatus in, in the house. And um, so this is Willard, you know, at, at one of his presses. Um, if you know some of Ansel Adams' early books, you know they were printed by Morgan and Morgan. So they were all very close friends. Bill Brandt, um, again, there's friendships, visitors. If Beaumont was in Europe, if Brandt was in America, um, there was, you know, many opportunities to communicate, to correspond over the years. Uh, Paul Strand, very close friend. As I said, you know, my first time meeting Beaumont in person was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art for the opening of the Paul Strand exhibition. Strand, during those years, he maintained uh, his house in, in Lower Manhattan, but he primarily lived in France. So he would come back and forth occasionally, but for the show at the Met, he was in New York for some months, and um, I had the honor and opportunity to meet him a few times during those months, but this was taken during a visit um, Beaumont made to Orgival in France to visit Paul Strand. Beaumont loved this self-portrait, and it kind of brings things in a way full circle. It's Beaumont is a historian and Beaumont is a curator. Beaumont was asked to curate this show for the Museum of Modern Art in the 70s. The show was called The Photo Eye of the 20s. And I mentioned early on of the film Variety that Eric Solomon, uh, sorry, Eric Mendelssohn book, uh, America. You know, Beaumont loved this period of the 20s, which was very much about angles of view and looking up and looking down. I mean, the current um, edition of the history of photography has a beautiful Rochenko photograph that graces the cover. You know, this was a very exciting period um, for Beaumont. So he, he curated the show and he wanted the show to be a little different. And typically, if you remember the early days of the Museum of Modern Art, if there was a show on the first floor, when you walk down 53rd Street, they would block out the windows. Um, they would kind of cover the windows. So you'd, you know, you'd go inside and, and go into those galleries. But Beaumont wanted the, the show to start in the street. So he not only had those windows open to the street so you could look in and see the photographs hanging on the walls. There were also a number of, of artworks that Beaumont was not able to ha get a original prints of loaned for the exhibition. And he didn't want to show copy prints. So rather than have copy prints made, he had this rare screen projector 
set up um, on the window, and you see that um, Elisitsky uh, photograph, that's that slide. Well, that was a slide projector that was changing slides. So the show literally started from the street. If you stood out in the street and you watched the images um, changing on that rear screen projector, um, you saw the part of the show that wasn't available inside. And then you also saw those beginning galleries there. And then you went in and of course you saw the rest of the show. So this is a self-portrait. It's Beaumont's reflection in the window of this exhibition of the institution that he had so much a part of. So it's kind of a, a multi-layered self-portrait of Beaumont and his work, curator, historian, first director of the department, beginning history of photography. Anyway, in a way, it's a, it's a full autobiography um, in, in a photograph. And Beaumont was very aware of that, and, and he loved this self-portrait very much. This image of the Flatiron Building, I put it in because, again, it's one of those images that kind of bring everything together. It's, um, it has this, you know, interesting angle, which is a, something that, as I keep saying, Bomo is very interested in this idea of looking up and the angle. But it also, to me, it has a reference of, the, of a ship. It's almost, you know, the front of a, of a ship. So, it, I don't know, for me, it, it, it's kind of one of those photographs that have a lot of the elements, a lot of the interests of Beaumont kind of in, included within this composition of this very iconic and, of course, very well photographed building, uh, the Flatiron Building. Another very well photographed uh, site is this uh, cross uh, at this church in Las Trampas, New Mexico. But I don't know if you know, you're aware of it, but this was photographed years earlier. It was photographed by Ansel Adams. It was photographed by Edward Weston. So many photographers kind of made this image. Um, you know, a lot of you, you know, I'll show you in a minute, the Ranchos de Taos Church, which is another iconic uh, place to photograph in New Mexico, but the outside this uh, uh, grave site um, by the Las Trampas Church is also kind of photo history, you know, all wrapped into into one. Uh, 1980, Ansel was here visiting. He was working, they were working on a PBS uh, documentary, which you might have seen. There are segments with Beaumont, segments with George O'Keefe, and um, Ansel talking about his years uh, in New Mexico, in Taos, uh, at, the in at the invitation of Mabel Dodge. There's so many kind of layers. So this was uh, Beaumont uh, making this portrait of Ansel. This is the portrait of Ansel. And what Beaumont loved about this is uh, he loved how Ansel's hat kind of echoed the buttress of the Ranchos de Taos Church. If you're familiar with the buttress, it's really all there right in his hat. So it has, just Beaumont loved that, that um, repetition of that shape. Um, it was a lot of fun for him. Uh, and then I guess I add this kind of this little snap uh, that Mary Allender, who was Ansel's assistant at the time, of course, accompanied Ansel on this trip. And so she was kind enough. She made this picture of me with Beaumont and Ansel. And then I made a picture of her with Beaumont and Ansel, which was kind of a fun thing to do. But here you get actually get to see the front of the buttress um, that I was talking about that was kind of echoed in Ansel's hat. Well, um, a book of Beaumont's own photographs uh, was finally published um, in 1983 by a man named Gibbs Smith uh, from Peregrine Smith's book. And, and Ansel wrote the introduction. And in the introduction to that book, he writes, taste is an elusive word, rejected by those who do not possess it, 
and carefully used by those who profess authority, but not creativity. Beaumont's photographs display taste in its de most dependable meaning. And that was a, just a part of this wonderful introduction that Ansel wrote uh, about his good friend's photographs uh, for this book. And what Beaumont uh, wrote is in, in this same book, he writes something very interesting about his photography. He writes, over the years, photography has been to me what a journal is to a writer, a record of things seen and experienced, moments in the flow of time, documents of significance. To me, their experiments in seeing. And indeed, his, his own photography is very much experiments in seeing. So I said earlier, you know, I worked with Beaumont for about 14 years. I assisted him with some of his work and his library and his writing and his lectures. I had the opportunity to travel with him for probably nine years. And I mean, I like to tell people he, he taught me, you know, which fork to use. You know, we would go and eat at these very fancy restaurants, which was all new to me. And I have all these forks and spoons, and he would teach me how to use the silverware. He taught me how to order wine. He, he taught me how to be a man. He taught me so much about life besides what he taught me about history, history of photography, and photography itself. And as I said, in so many ways, I'm still digesting um, all that I learned from him. Um, every day Beaumont is on my mind and every day I'm thinking of something he said to me. It was a great honor for me to, to spend those years with him and it's an equal honor to be able to share some of this with you. So thank you for joining us today. Check out our website, photographydealers.com. Look at our blogs, look at our YouTube videos at the Scheinbaum and Russick page. Um, and write to us, give us some ideas to do presentations and give us some feedback. Um, I know these talks end up being long, but um, that's the way it needs to be, I guess. Um, so thank you again. Be safe, take care, and stay productive.